The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, Paul preached in the synagogues of Damascus, and his preaching was so effective that they gave him a thorough flogging with Jewish rods. Now, the head of a synagogue did have the authority to have somebody beaten with rods, and the standard Jewish punishment was 40 stripes, save one, or 39 stripes. Well, it's hardly likely that the Jews would resort at once to the strongest measures. And the scourgings, and, and Paul received, he was scourged five times. The scourgings uh, might be taken as a reminder that uh, worse could come. Worse being, he could be stoned. And indeed, there are few more striking proofs of the severity of that life, which the apostle Paul seems to so cheerfully, uh, even so joyfully endured that then the fact that in his actual biography, not one of these five afflictions, that's five floggings, terrible as we know they must have been, he doesn't even mention them. And in his epistles, they are only recorded among trials that were even worse. And he gives these five beatings a kind of a passing and casual illusion. But we know uh, from the example of the apostles at Jerusalem, that no such pain or danger would have put a stop to his ministry. And like them, he would have seen an honor in such a disgrace. Well, you know, enough is enough. And at last, the Jews were exasperated beyond all they could endure with somebody whom they hated as a renegade and they could not even enjoy the luxury of despising as a heretic, so they made a secret plan to kill Paul. Well, the conspiracy was made known to Paul. The only way to keep a secret is to never let it out. And uh, the plot was made known to Paul, and so Paul was on guard against it. Well, the Jews then took stronger and more open measures. They watched the gates day and night to prevent the possibility of his escape. You know, in the United States of America, we are blessed. I know a young pastor in Columbia, South America, a young man, and he has to take a different way. He rides the bus, take a different way to his church every Sunday so he doesn't set a pattern because he has refused to go along with the drug cartels and, uh, you know, they offered to um, kind of help finance his church. Uh, he wouldn't go along with them, and so he had to, had to plan different ways of getting to church. Well, Paul was being careful, but, of course, in an old-fashioned city, you had walls and gates, and so the Jews watched the gates day and night to prevent Paul from escaping. And in this, they were assisted by the ethnarch, political leader who supplied them with the means of doing it. In other words, he put uh, soldiers at their disposal. Well, the ethnarch was either the Arab viceroy of Hareth or the chief official of the Jews themselves. And the Jews, even in a Gentile country, might possess this kind of authority if they were under a friendly prince. Well, there was thus a, a very real and imminent danger that Saul or Paul would be cut off at the beginning of his career. But that was not to be. Now, I like this expression in the book of Acts. The disciples took Saul. Uh, I think they were ready to get Saul out of there. So they took Saul. And that's an expression which also would tend to show that he was exceptionally in need of help and put him in a large rope basket and let him down through the window of a house which abutted on the wall of the city. Well, it may be that they had to choose a favorable moment 
when the patrol that went around the city had passed. So after the patrol passed and had not yet turned around, they probably let him down. In any case, the, the escape was kind of humiliating. It must have been this humiliation or else the fact of its being among the earliest perils which he had either undergone. It seemed to fix it so incredibly on the memory of Paul. It's not always the worst thing that happens to us, or the best thing for that matter that impresses us the most. But sometimes a very small thing, especially in the case of a man like Paul, whose ministry is just getting un underway, small things really make an impression. And while Saul suffered, or Paul suffered, far worse things than having to leave the city, nonetheless, this humiliation was incredibly and indelibly fixed on his memory. And nearly 20 years afterwards, he mentions it to the Corinthians with special emphasis after agonies and hairbreadth escapes, which to us would have seemed far more formidable. But no, it's this particular thing that really disturbed Paul. And it is interesting if you think about the things that do or do not disturb us. So here then, cloaked in shame, danger, the first page of his checkered and sad career come to a halt, he made his way to Jerusalem, and how he did it is just a matter of conjecture. And doubtless, as he stole through the dark night alone, above all, as he passed the very spot where Christ had appeared to him and taken hold of him, knocked him off his horse, and into one moment of his life, a whole eternity had been crowded, his heart would have been full of thoughts far too deep for words. Well, it has been supposed from the expression of which he makes use in his speech to Agrippa, that he may have preached in many synagogues on the days which were occupied on his journey back to Jerusalem, because this time he's not riding in company with other people, but doubtless he is walking and so he walks probably for several hours, comes to a synagogue, takes advantage of the accommodations which are available, and then went on the next day. For so much of the world, in places that World Missionary Evangelism has missions, water is not there. And when it is, it's not safe. World Missionary Evangelism for more than 50 years has drilled and dug water wells. And we've done it more than just to supply a community with water. We've done it to save lives. Because the largest killer in most third world countries is fouled or polluted water. Our water programs have saved thousands of lives. Not long ago, we drilled a well in Kenya, and a man who watched the water coming out of the ground, an elder in a Maasai community, walked up to our president and said, did your God do this? And essentially, yes, he did. It has changed an entire community. That water well began it, but now there's education through schools. There's children's programs. There are churches. There are so many other things going on thanks to a gift of water. The next time you drink a glass of water from your tap, remember it's pure gold in many parts of the world. The next time you pour a glass of water out, think that you're pouring out something that someone else would treasure more than anything else. Paul has been helped to escape from Damascus. And I'm quite sure he got some very enthusiastic help because 
There's no doubt the Christians would want to get him out of there. Paul was a troublemaker, a uh, wonderful man, but he seems to have riled people up. Possibly as he walked back to Jerusalem, he may have preached in many synagogues on the days which uh, were occupied by this journey. But while that seems consistent with his statement to Agrippa, it seems inconsistent with his own statement uh, that he was unknown by face. That's an interesting statement. He was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. So we're really not sure. But it is, however, unlikely, or likely rather, that he may sometimes have availed himself of the guest chambers which were attached to Jewish synagogues, and if such were the case, he might have taught the first truths of the gospel to the Jews without being flung into close contact initially with Christian communities. And remember, Christian communities didn't really want to see him. They were suspicious of him. In any case, his journey could not have been much prolonged because Paul tells us that it was his express object in Jerusalem to visit Peter. And Peter's recognition must have been invaluable to help him. Apart from the help and insight into the things of the Christ, which he could not but derive from conversing with one, namely Peter, who had lived in such intimate friendship with the Lord. Well, to visit Jerusalem must have cost the future apostle no small effort. And his remorse must have been very deep as he neared the spot where he'd seen the corpse of the martyr Stephen lying crushed under the stones. And with what awful interest must he have looked on the scene of the crucifixion and the spot where he who was now risen and glorified had laid in the garden tomb. You must remember this, and I have been at this spot where they believed Jesus was crucified. The place of the skull and the hill is right at the uh, central bus station in Jerusalem, at least it used to be. And uh, so it's right up against the, the city of Jerusalem itself. And that was the Roman practice. They didn't take people away to a state penitentiary to crucify them. They crucified them in an obvious public trafficked place, the purpose being to show people who came along if anyone had the idea that they were going to commit crime and do that sort of thing and misbehave, uh, take a look at this person on the cross and see if that's where you want to wind up. So that's how they did it. So. As Peter comes to Jerusalem, if he came in that same way that I'm talking about, you know, he must have had some deep, deep thoughts. And how dreadful must have been the revulsion of feeling which rose from the utter change of his present relations toward the priests whose belief he had abandoned and the Christian whose gospel he had embraced. Well, Paul had left Jerusalem a rabbi, a Pharisee, a fanatic defender of the oral law. He's now entering Jerusalem as one who utterly distrusted the value of legal righteousness, one who wholly despised the beggarly elements of tradition. The proud man had become unspeakably humble. The savage persecutor, unspeakably tender. The self-satisfied rabbi had abandoned in one moment his pride of nationality, his exclusive scorn, his pharisaic preeminence to take in exchange for them the beatitude of unjust persecution and to become the suffering pe preacher of an execrated faith. Now, what could Paul expect from Theophilus? You know, he'd gotten letters from Theophilus, and now he's coming back to Jerusalem, and by this time, Theophilus and everyone knows 
that uh, what Paul is doing. And so what could he expect from Theophilus, whose letters he had probably destroyed? What could he expect from the Sanhedrists, the Council of Seventy, whose zeal he had fired up? What could he expect from his old fellow pupils in the lecture room of Gamaliel, who had seen in Saul of Tarsus, one, who in learning was the glory of the school of Hillel, and in zeal was the rival of the fundamentalist school of Shammai. And how would he be treated by these friends of his youth, by these teachers and companions of his life, now that proclaiming his system, his learning, his conviction, and his whole life, and incidentally, theirs also, he's proclaiming it to have been irremediably wrong. And Paul has become an open adherent of the little church, which he once devastated, ravaged, and destroyed. But amid this natural shrinking, with which he would obviously anticipate an encounter so full of trial, he would doubtless console himself with the thought that he would find among the Christians a brother's welcoming from those sweet and gentle spirits whose faith he had witnessed, whose love for each other he had envied, while at the same time he hated them. And how exquisite would be the pleasure of sharing that peace which he had tried to shatter and of urging on others those arguments which had been bringing conviction to his own mind while he was most passionately resisting and of hearing again from the holy and gentle lips the words of him, namely Jesus of Nazareth, had at once despised. And so Paul is going back to Jerusalem. On the one hand, he's worried about his old friends and their reception and looking forward to the Christians and theirs. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many Native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you, who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this Native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bible, and that allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. had to escape from Damascus, walk to Jerusalem. And, you know, he's kind of double-minded. He's thinking about the bad reception he's probably going to get, a very cold reception, even perhaps a deadly reception from his old friends that he grew up with, that he trained with as a Pharisee. But on the other hand, Saul might well have thought that the love, the nobleness, the enthusiasm 
of his new brethren would more than compensate for the influence and admiration which he had voluntarily given up. I mean, I've given up everything, and now I'm coming to them, and surely they appreciate it. Well, and perhaps he thought to pluck with joy from them the fair fruit of the Spirit, namely love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance, things for which he might cheerfully abandon the whole world. So there's no wonder that he tried, or as the King James says, essayed to join himself to the disciples. Now, Paul's knowledge of human nature might have warned him that confidence is a plant of slow growth and that a reputation such as he had earned uh, made it uh, hardly possible that he would be received by confidence on the part of the Christians. And it may be that he counted too much in the change wrought in human disposition by the grace of God. Well, as somebody has said, the old Adam is often too strong for the young Melanchthon. Well, a new trial awaited Paul. Peter, whom he had expressly come to see, immediately received him with the large generosity of his impulsive heart. And being a married man, Peter offered him hospitality without grudging. But at first, that was all. And it speaks no little for the greatness and goodness of Peter. And his conduct is quite in accordance with the natural nobleness that we would expect to find in one whom Jesus himself had loved and blessed. And that he was the first of the brethren to rise above the influence of suspicion is quite remarkable. Peter was at this time the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And as such, Peter had not been one of those who fled before the storm of persecution. Now, Peter had to know, put yourself in Peter's position. He had to know that it was at the feet of this young Pharisee that the garments of Stephen's murderers had been laid. How would you feel? Here's a man who has been ravaging the church tried to get you too. Uh, he's responsible for Stephen stoning, and now I'm going to meet him. It takes grace. It takes grace. But it can happen. I have had to meet some people uh, in my life who have done me wrong. It's amazing the grace that God can give you. I've had to meet some people I knew were living in very wrong situations. But God can give you the grace. Well, Peter must have feared Paul perhaps have even hidden himself from Paul when Paul was forcing his way into Christian homes. And the heart of Peter must have ached when he saw his little congregation slain, scattered, and destroyed in the community whose faith had been so bright and whose enthusiasm had been so contagious and their common love so tender and pure to see that rudely broken up by the pitiless persecution of Saul, one of the pupil of the schools. Yet with the unquestioning trustfulness of a sunny nature and with that spiritual insight into character by which divine charity not only preserves real worth, but even creates worthiness where it did not exist before, Peter opened his door to one whom a meaner man might have excluded as still to possibly a wolf in the fold. Now, of the other leaders of the church, if there were any at that time in Jerusalem, not one came near the new convert, not one so much as spoke to him. And on every side, Paul was met by cold, distrustful looks. So at one stroke, he'd lost all his old friends, 
and now it seemed very likely he wouldn't get any new ones in their place. The brethren, for the most part, and you can't blame them, regarded Paul with terror and mistrust. They did not believe that he was a disciple at all. And the facts which accompanied his alleged conversion, they may have heard about them, but they had occurred three years before. People can change in three years. And the news of his recent preaching in peril in Damascus couldn't have reached them, highly unlikely. But even if it had, it would have seemed so strange that they might have been pardoned for looking with doubt on one who was their worst persecutor now turned professed brother. For even fearing that the asserted con uh, conversion might only be a ruse to allow Paul to learn their secrets, get into their midst, and so entrap them to their final end. So naturally, Paul is suspected. And so at first, his fellowship and intercourse with the brethren in the church of Jerusalem was almost totally confined, no surprise, almost totally confined to his reception in the house of Peter. Now, I remember when I was younger, I read the words that Paul said when he said, quote, other of the apostles saw I none. That's what Paul said to the Galatians, save James, the Lord's brother. And I always thought, wow, Paul was pretty exclusive and self-confident. But now I realize, of course, it wasn't that Paul didn't want to see them. The fact of the matter is they didn't want to see Paul. And so the only other one he saw was James. World Missionary Evangelism began its work over 50 years ago with seven orphan children. Today, WME is working in developing countries around the world. Every day, WME programs are changing lives by meeting basic physical needs and saving souls by reaching out to the lost with the good news of Jesus Christ. You can partner with WME in a variety of ways to help those in desperate need. To learn more about WME's mission and work, please visit us on the web at www.wme.org. If you want to become a monthly sponsor for a child or native minister, support a particular project. If you would like to mail a donation, please send it to World Missionary Evangelism, P.O. Box 660800, Dallas, Texas 75266. You can make a world of difference in a precious life by contacting WME today. Thank you for your continued prayers and support of this ministry, and may God abundantly bless you.